Endocarditis rheumatic heart disease differentials confuses cardiac for US MLA. So endocarditis will present as new onset murmur plus fever in a patient who's septic. You can get benign flow murmurs, functional slash transient murmurs and in viral infections. We have increased heart rate across the pulmonic, increased heart rate with increased flow across the pulmonic slash aortic valves. But if you have a patient who's septic, high leukocytes, high fever, and you're trying to discern the etiology of what's actually going on, murmur plus fever, you want to be thinking endocarditis till proven otherwise. Acute versus subacute types, which I'll talk about. Left-sided valves, aortic mitral, are more frequently affected than right-sided tricuspid pulmonic because of greater pressure on the left side, which allows for uh, greater seeding, greater turbulence with greater proclivity for seeding of bacteria on a valve. You could be aware IV drug users can get right side endocarditis due to inoculation of the veins with staph aureus and then goes back to the right side of the heart, so tricuspid pulmonic lesions. Acute endocarditis is going to be staph aureus. It's a past level point you got to know is the most common organism. And it's a patient who's not had any prior valve issues. So IV drug user is a classic example who now has a murmur plus fever. Okay, as I just said, you can get inoculation of the veins, IV drug user goes back to the right side of the heart, causing EG tricuspid lesions. So <clears throat> what they're going to do on the USMLE, they're not going to play trivia, by the way, as far as you have a 24-year-old IV drug user and you've got endocarditis, which valve is most commonly affected? It's not school of medicine bullshit, okay? What they're going to do is say, 24-year-old IV drug user, there's a high fever, uh, high leukocytes, Patient has a two on six holosystolic murmur that increases with inspiration, and that's tricuspid regurg. Okay, so you know based on the descriptor there. Whereas if they say two on six holosystolic murmur that increases with expiration, that would be mitral regurg in that setting. Subacute endocarditis. Okay, so this is going to be uh, patients who have prior valve issues, e.g., bicuspid valve. Okay, histriomatic heart disease, which is going to be mitral regurg as a kid, mitral stenosis later in life. So uh, any valve issue, you're going to get strep viridans. Now, it's actually pretty rare that the Yosemite will write strep viridans in answer choice. You need to know strep sanguinis, sanguis, mutants, mitis. These are all different uh, ways that they can write uh, strep viridans. These are just types of strep viridans, okay? Strep viridans is a broad term. And these organisms will produce carbohydrate limit dextrins, which allow them to adhere to abnormal valves, okay? So history of dental procedure is very high yield. They'll literally just say, like, 39-year-old dude uh, had a dental procedure and now has a high fever with a new onset murmur. And then I'll ask the student, I'm like, well, which organism do you think it is? And they're like, not sure. And I'm like, well, isn't that subacute endocarditis? Because they mentioned dental procedure there with strep viridans and Right? So the guy probably has some underlying abnormality. Because strep viridans doesn't cause acute endocarditis, like pretty much always. Like for you, Similli, it's going to be staph aureus for acute, no prior valve issue. Strep viridans, sanguinis, sanguis, mutans, mitis uh, for uh, subacute. So just some general points I want to make is reactive thrombocytosis, a.k.a. reactive thrombo cythemia on you, Similli. Normal platelets, 150 to 450. You should just be aware that severe infections can occasionally cause release of platelets from the spleen, okay? So increased release from the bone marrow slash decreased sequestration from the spleen. That can occasionally occur, and for whatever reason, endocarditis is a favorite diagnosis for or on USMLE uh, when this can occur. So you might get a vignette, a patient with uh, IV drug user, right, with a, a murmur and a fever, and platelets are... 1.1 million and you're like what the hell like how the how is that possible and it's just reactive thrombocytosis okay um some of you who've seen my other content will get real emotional right now because uh i just said 1.1 million but technically reactive thrombocytosis does tend to be under a million okay whereas essential uh essential thrombocytosis which is a jack 2 mutation unrelated um that's unrelated to an infection, that can that typically causes over a million. I'm just getting technical right now. Some of you get highly emotional. So in acroditis, you can get hematuria. That's a bit of a weird finding. So you're like, why is there like red urine? It's because you can technically get vegetations that launch off to the kidney. 
endocarditis in a stroke-like episode is septic embolus. Okay, so you have the bacterial vegetation from the left side of the heart, mitral aortic. It's launched off to the brain. And U.S. similarly just wants antibiotics uh, as the answer. It makes sense. You would do that for endocarditis as well as for septic embolus, but I've seen that in the setting of septic embolus as the answer, and especially to prevent brain abscess. Okay, So Janeway lesions are uh, septic emboli that have gone to the fingers. Okay, so They can present as violaceous lesions. Osler nodes are, are painful lesions on the hand that are actually an immune response to vegetations that have launched off, and they're immune complexes. Splinter hemorrhages, okay, so just... Uh, linear uh, hemorrhages under the fingernails. So you got to know that these are associated with endocarditis. Like if you don't know that these are associated with endocarditis, that's pretty much, a, those are past level details, okay? Even though I'm making a point that, well, they're actually lower yield for vignettes, but you still should fucking know them. The Hasek organisms, garbage for you, Somalia. I don't think I've ever seen them show up, so I'm not even going to cover them, but some of you are like, well, what about the Hasek organisms? So blood culture. Uh, so 2CK stuff real quick. I know some of you are saying for step one, but just 2CK real quick is just the, you're going to do blood cultures before antibiotics because in three, three, three blood cultures, three tubes of blood, because if you do antibiotics first, you're going to end up pulling the antibiotics out of the blood when you do the blood cultures and the antibiotics you just put in. And number two is you're going to fuck with your blood cultures because you're starting to kill off organisms and potentially even changing sensitivities right away. We, we don't know. So you don't want to do antibiotics first. Uh, so you're going to do a transesophageal echocardiogram and um, not a transthoracic echocardiogram. So a T is what we do when we're looking for vegetations in the valves. Transthoracic is when we're looking for ejection fraction and heart failure. So empiric therapy is vancomycin, which covers gram positives, which will cover MRSA. Okay, methicillin resistant staph virus plus gentamicin, which covers gram negatives, okay, or ampicillin sulbactam. As I just fucking said, vancomycin gram positive, gentamicin gram negatives. And so endocarditis prophylaxis can be ampicillin or penicillin, can also be cefoxetin. That's sort of a weird factoid um, that second generation cephalosporins can be used for surgical prophylaxis, okay. Uh, in general, not even limited to endocarditis, um, that gets asked maybe once every once or twice a year, uh, where a student will drop that uh, question in the Telegram group, let's say, and it's like, yeah, I know it's weird, but for whatever reason, they like second generation cephalosporins like cefloxetin is what you can give for uh, prophylaxis surgically. Endocarditis. Uh, prophylaxis indications so this stuff's high yield for 2ck all right if you're studying for step one you're gonna have to ace 2ck eventually so if the patients had a history of endocarditis makes sense that you would give prophylaxis if a patient has any history of uh, cyanotic heart disease uh, congenital cyanotic heart disease if there's any prosthetic material in the heart whatsoever if there's incompletely repaired uh, congenital heart disease and if a patient has a heart transplant with a valve abnormality so you can obviously pause the presentation and memorize these so yeah, I wrote that, uh, endocarditis, prosthetics, cyanotic heart disease, it's not completely repaired. Okay, any prosthetics in the heart whatsoever. So you can just memorize those, they're important. And let's see. Yeah, I actually didn't write it down. I thought I, was, I, thought I actually put it down, but I didn't. Um, you should know that uh, a high yield point is that you don't give endocarditis prophylaxis for mere mitral regurge, mitral valve prolapse. I thought I wrote that down. Didn't fucking, how did I not put that in the presentation? I mean, I'm fucking saying it, but like under this, I would normally write um, important reasons not to give it is if a patient simply has mitral valve prolapse, okay? Or they say that there's aortic stenosis or if they're mitral regurge and you're like, well, there's a valve abnormality. We should give the prophylaxis because they could get strep viridens and endocarditis from a dental procedure, couldn't they? It makes total sense. And that's why this is hard. Okay. That's why I'm covering this right now. Because it tends to be on US simile step two and three, that giving prophylaxis is the wrong answer. I would say like four out of five times, believe it or not. Okay. They'll give you mitral valve prolapse or mitral regurge. And the answer is don't give prophylaxis. Okay. 
So rheumatic heart disease, I know it's group A strep, strepagenes, pharyngitis, and then the immune system is going to make antibodies against the group A strep M protein. And those antibodies will cross-react with mitral valves. It's type 2 hypersensitivity. It's molecular mimicry. Can occur with the aortic valve in theory, but in US only it's always mitral valve. Causes mitral regurge acutely, so holostolic murmur. Uh, whereas years later, mitral stenosis, so rumbling diastolic murmur, opening snap, decrescendo, mid to late diastolic murmur. So Jones, an easy way to remember what you see with rheumatic heart disease. So joints, you have high arthritis. Your O is a heart for carditis. You can get subcutaneous nodules, erythema marginatum, which is, is a serpiginous or annular ring type rash, and Sinaham chorea, which is a basal ganglia autoimmune response, creating a dance-like movements. So you could just memorize Jones here. It's a good mnemonic for you. And then this is important that cutaneous strep, such as impetigo, erysipelas, cellulitis, uh, can cause PSGN, type 3 hypersensitivity, so red urine, one to three weeks after the infection, but don't cause rheumatic heart disease. Okay, so they might give you a kid who's at impetigo for seven days, and he's got red urine, and students are like shocked that you can get PSGN from that. It's like, of course you can get PSGN from cutaneous strep, but you're not going to get rheumatic heart disease from cutaneous strep, okay? They want penicillin uh, for the for treatment of rheumatic heart disease and to uh, prevent it in patients who uh, have pharyngitis. Okay, so conditions confused with cardio. So they like panic attack. Now, what they'll do is give you a young patient who feels like he or she's going to die. And they might mention that there's a history of MI in the family. So they really try to juice you up and make you think that this is cardio. They love doing this. So, <clears throat> and it's just panic attack. But what they'll also do sometimes is tell you that they'll give you a big fucking paragraph about some 19 year old dude who's hyperventilating, freaking out, feeling like impending sense of doom, he's gonna die. And they'll say that there's a mid systolic click and they'll say which the following is the most likely explanation for the patient's findings and mitral prolapse is wrong. Students confused because they're like, but OMG, there's a, there's a mid systolic click though. Right, but the MVP itself isn't causing the symptoms. It's a panic attack. Okay, so you just got to know that. And then you treat breathing exercises uh, plus a benzo. Usually, benzo is just the answer, but technically, if you see breathing exercises, it's correct. Breathing into a bag is the wrong answer. It's on one of the forms where they have breathing into a bag. It's literally fucking wrong. Okay, you're going to choose benzo if it's listed alongside it. So, orthostasis, so orthostatic hypotension, it's a drop of systolic blood pressure greater than 20 millimeters mercury, diastolic greater than 10 millimeters mercury when you go from supine to standing. And it's due to fluid depletion, okay? So uh, yeah, patient can just get lightheaded and they'll have a drop in blood pressure. They'll tell you the blood pressures and you'll just need to know it's orthostasis. If they don't tell you the blood pressures, they just say patient's been on a loop diuretic, let's say, and gets fainting when he or she stands up, well, you know that's orthostatic hypotension, okay? So they like diuretics as your big risk factor there. Um, yeah, I mean, I write this in the confused with cardio. It is technically cardiovascular in terms of regulation based on blood pressure, but it's fluid depletion is the ideology. It's not the heart itself. Phase of basal syncope, okay? So this is going to be uh, usually a youngish 20s, 30s female who has a stressor, uh, emotional event that occurs, and you get a quick, and followed by fainting, okay? So you get a quick sympathetic response, which can, uh, baroreceptor firing rate can increase, and then you get a quick compensatory parasympathetic response following that, that's excessive, and heart rate will decrease too much, uh, vascular tone will be insufficient, so the patient gets lightheadedness, can faint, okay? It's a bit of a difficult such nebulous mechanism. For U.S. simile, it's more just uh, they can give you a 24-year-old girl who uh, she's had a stressor and she faints, and the answer is something like failure to increase heart rate appropriately or failure to maintain vascular tone. It's pretty easy if you see it, okay? And then for 2CK, in slash three, you can be aware that something called a tilt table test is done to reproduce symptoms of syncope, uh, and that will diagnose your vasovagal syncope. Okay, so just know that that can be done. Cryotic sinus hypersensitivity. You could just be aware that this is a diagnosis. It's a thing. So some of you seeing this right now, like, didn't even know that this is a thing. So they'll give you some dude who's shaving, 
and he stretched his carotid sinus baroreceptors. It's a long discussion, the whole autoregulation, but carotid sinus baroreceptor firing rate would increase cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal up to the solitary nucleus of the medulla, and then you get increased vagal uh, cranial nerve 10 efferent coming back down to the nodal tissue, and that's going to slow your heart rate. Okay, so um, what they can have is the answer. They can give you this situation where you're shaving, and then they say, which the following is the most likely explanation for the patient's lightheadedness? And the answer is, sinus bradycardia holy shit okay and students like well why is that and it's like well we have increased vagal uh response from stretching the carotid sinus baroreceptors okay costochondritis inflammation of the rib joints can be idiopathic and also viral induced all right so what they'll do is give you a big paragraph where you'll be thinking oh this could be cardiac but then they're gonna say in there like they'll give you 10 lines and one of the lines will say the pain is worse when he or she reaches over the head or behind the back. Okay. They can say that, or they can say it's worse with palpation. If they say both. It's easy, but the student will choose something cardio. And I'm like, well, does cardiac pain get worse when you reach over your head or behind your back? No. I'm like, what does that mean? It means it's MSK. And likewise with palpation, it means it's MSK. All right. So Chlorodynia, this one can sound like uh, costochondritis. Actually, no, sorry. Uh, well, actually, they can all sound the fucking same, but I, pleurodynia is when you have a viral infection where now you just get sharp lateral chest pain, okay? So pleurodynia is going to sound like uh, viral pleurisy, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, but pleurodynia is going to be uh, intercostal uh, muscle spasm due to a viral infection, okay? So it's sharp lateral chest pain. Uh, usually Coxsackie B virus, it's asked twice on the two CKNBMEs. You're studying for step one, you're like, well, are you sure it's going to show up on the step one exam? It's fair game, okay? So I can tell you viral pleurisy shows up on the step one, which I'll talk about. But pleurodynia, despite the name, it has nothing to do with the lungs. It's an MSK diagnosis, so intercostal muscle spasm, and usually Coxsackie B virus. And they can tell you creatine kinase is increased. In fact, they say creatine kinase increase in both questions, even though it's not mandatory in theory, okay? And that's due to increased muscle tone from the spasm, and uh, it can release CK as a result, okay? Viral pleurisy, this is the one that's, that can be confused with pleuridinia, uh, not the costochondritis. So viral pleurisy is just viral infection, and you have inflammation of the pleura, okay? So it can present as lateral chest pain generally, and... Um, you might think it's the same thing as pleuridinia, but this one genuinely is not MSK, all right, and CK won't be elevated. They're not going to list pleuridinia and viral pleurisy alongside each other, don't worry, okay? But you just got to know that these are differentials. If someone were to say, what are differentials of sharp lateral chest pain? You're like, hmm, no fucking idea. You say, well, could be viral infection causing pleuridinia, could be viral pleurisy, and especially when you get to 2CK level, the question need not even tell you that there was a viral infection, okay? About half the time when you have etiologies, whether it's ITP, whether it's de Quervain thyroiditis, whether it's toxic synovitis to the hip, quite, uh, diagnoses that are classically caused by viral infections, the vignette doesn't have to tell you that, okay? So they'll just give you random fucking 30-year-old who's got sharp lateral chest pain. That's it. No other information. And you're like, well, it's not pericarditis, it's not pleural effusion, it's not tamponade, and you're left with viral pleurisy, okay? I mean, it's not, it's not dramatic. So diffuse esophageal spasm. You just need to know that this can present similarly to angina, uh, but the patient's not going to have cardiovascular disease, all right? So the pain may or may not be related to food intake, but it's often unrelated. And if they happen to show you a barium, I didn't bother showing you here because it's not even high yield. I'm just letting you know that it could technically appear corkscrew in the esophagus, I'll cover that stuff in more detail in GI presentations, uh, but it's a diagnosis of exclusion, okay? So when, you, when you've ruled out cardiac causes, obviously the red flags are all the cardiac, right? So once you figure out the patient doesn't have any cardiovascular disease, nothing wrong on that front, you say, okay, this could be diffuse esophageal spasm. Uh, so be aware of that as a diagnosis. Nutcracker esophagus is just another way of saying diffuse esophageal spasm. And then GERD, of course, we could do a very lengthy presentation. I'm doing a very curtailed one here because it's a cardiac presentation overall. But obviously, due to decreased lower esophageal sphincter tone, we get irritation of the uh, distal esophagus by stomach acid. And obesity is a major risk factor. 
because it causes a decreased tone of the LES, okay, stretch, increased stretching of the LES, decreased tone. Hiatal hernia is a risk factor, okay, so uh, that's where you can have uh, an upward a sliding hiatal hernia where you have the cardia of the stomach that is superiorly uh, translocated through the LES, okay, so a high percentage of patients with hiatal hernia are going to present with GERD, it's more surgery stuff, TCK, and also, apart from the very buzzy presentation, if I were to say to you, well, how does GERD present? You're going to be like, well, someone's got burning in the throat, and it's worse after meals when they lie down. Okay, well, that's past level. But you also got to know that there can be atypical presentations where they don't say that. They just say, patient's got recurrent pneumonitis, okay, recurrent lung infections. There might be some scarring, and occasionally gets a, a nocturnal cough. That's GERD. Okay, so you got to know that presentation for you as simile. It can lead to barrett esophagus, of course. So uh, barrett esophagus being your metaplasia, where you get non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, uh, becomes your intestinal columnar cells. Okay, so intestinal columnar has your uh, goblet, uh, mucus-producing cells. In the stomach, you, the mucus-producing cells are called mucus neck cells, not goblet cells, uh, which is why we say intestinal columnar. And then it leads to esophageal adenocarcinoma, not squamous. Squamous will be the upper two thirds of the esoph esophagus. And that's going to be smoking alcohol. Okay, other causes of squamous, garbage for you, assimilate. Just real quick here, because once again, this was cardio presentation, but just hopping through important stuff is just two week trial PPI is what you're going to do to diagnose GERD. And the symptoms should mitigate. And there's one question floating around where they have two week trial of an H2 blocker as an answer on a surgery form. Uh, but if you're forced into a situation where you're going to choose an H2 blocker versus PPI, always go with the PPI and you assimilate, okay? And then for patients who fail the two-week trial PPI, but we still strongly suspect GERD, uh, especially for the atypical presentations, nocturnal cough and recurrent pneumonitis, you can do a 24-hour pH monitor. Mesin fund application is where the we wrap the fundus of the stomach around the, uh, the LES and staple it. It's an answer on a couple questions for US Simile, especially pediatric GERD, which I'm not going to get into in this presentation. All right, so not ultra dramatic here. I'm obviously going to make more presentations and uh, subscribe to my channels. That's it.